you and welcome to the public library. Hey, my name is Liz. I'm the head librarian on, at the moment. How are you? Great. Um, have you been here before? Um, if so, can you just swipe your library card on the way in? No? Okay. Um, would you like to sign up to be a member of the library? Fantastic. And um, before you do it, I just need to make sure that you are in our um, constituency. So if you wouldn't mind telling me your current address. Alright, it looks like you are in fact in our constituency. So we get to this library here. Uh, could you give me your first and last name please? And could you spell that last name for me? Great. Um, and what about the address again? Yeah, I type it under the system just to look it up, but I honestly don't remember it too well. And can you give me the air code of that? Great. And just um, a little profiler. Um, oh, before I forget. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so overwhelmed. I forget a lot of things now. Um, could you give me your date of birth, please? Yes, yeah, so you have to be over 13 years old to get a public library card by yourself. Um, if not, you need uh, parental permission. And they can sign on. Lovely. Uh, so I always do a little bit of a profiler. Um, when people come to the library just because then that helps them uh, find better books um, like the things you recommend yeah okay so could you give me a uh, your top three authors at the moment okay okay no I'm a massive fan of you I cannot wait for her next book to come out and could you tell me your top three genres? So that can be uh, non-fiction, which counts as one overall, just so you know. Great. Okay. So that's just a little profiler. The reason I ask is because um, if you opt in, uh, when you first scan out your book, actually, I think I'd like probably do that for you now if you are interested um i can put your email address in and then once a month we will send you out um a list of the top books in those genres or authors similar to them that are popular uh, with their books uh, just so you can constantly get a new flow of books in and recommendations would you like that lovely uh, could you go ahead and uh, call me out your email address there Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, here you go. Here is your card. Uh, welcome to the library. Um, so you know that with that library card, you're allowed to take up up to five books at a time. Uh, and in general, uh, the books, the um, loan is for two weeks at a time, unless it's a book that is in high demand, in which case it will be one week. Uh, and you have the option to renew every book once. So the max time you can have most books out is about a month. Um, and for high demand books, it's two weeks. Yeah, so on checkout, um, we'll let you know what books are high demand if you have any. Um, but the default is that they're not, uh, unless otherwise stated. Okay, lovely. Um, now, if you're interested to get started with a book, I have a few recommendations that might interest you. Yeah, just based on the information you put in. Um, I have a stack of books here um, that I personally have read and enjoyed. Um, plus one I've been pushing for everyone. And nobody seems to be interested in it. I just want to talk about it. Okay, so maybe I'll start with that one. So I have The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Obviously, this is not very light reading book as I have annotated 
like my little notes. Anyway, yes, this is my personal copy. I love it because I find with some of these older books, especially written, this one is written in Middle English. Middle English. Middle English. So they can be a bit difficult to understand. So I find it easiest to annotate them. Yeah. So the Canterbury Tales is a collection of stories by Geoffrey Chaucer. And um, there's 15 of them, but apparently he was writing nearly 40, but then he died. Um so they're all of each one of them is about uh, a different character the narrator meets along the way to Bath. Uh, and the one I have been, or not, not to Bath, he meets the wife of Bath from Bath, England, on his way to Canterbury. So. Each one of them comes with, if you look in here, each one has a prologue to their story. So, The Wife of Bath I find a really, really interesting one out of these because her whole thing is about not wanting to submit to authority um, at the time uh, and what a horrible husband she has. Um, and just kind of a, an uptake of how the perfect wife should be viewed um, at the time. Which is a very interesting take uh, to see how things have changed. Um, I do think that the language is a bit of a barrier for this one. But it's still very good to read. I can read you a little bit of it, if you would like to get an idea. Yeah, it's a very good story, but it's just a little bit hard to understand. Yeah. So I'll just start, I think the best place to start is with the prologue. So I'm going to try my best to do it in the proper Middle English, um, but it's not exactly an easy task. And um, here we go. Experience through non authority, where in this world, right you enough for me to speak a woo that is in marriage. For lordlings sith, I twelfth year was of age. Thanked be to God that is in turn and the life. Husbands at the church door, I have five. I often, I so often might have ye wedded be, and all were worthy men in her degree. But me told certain not long ago is that Sith be Christ me one never on this to end in the cane of Galilee that by the same ensample taught he me that I should wed it be but once her neck eek low but a sharp word for the nuns beside a well Jesus God and men spack and rev with the Samaritan thou hast ye five husbands he was called and that it like man now hath thee, is not thine husband, thus say it is certain, but that he meant thereby, I not seen, but that I ask why the fifth man was noon husband to be the Samaritan. How many might have ye she have in marriage? Ye heard I never tell in mine age, upon this numb of dif differentiation, <laughs> men in my dive and glossing up and down, but well, I would express without a lie, God bade us for wax and multiply. The gentle text I well understood, equal I would, he said, mine husband, should let father and mother and take me. But no number mention he made. I couldn't tell if I was just the first page, and I'll give you a look. But you can see how it is written and how things are spelled. They're spelled, so for example, when she went to say 12, she spent it, uh, he spelled it T W E L F, and year is Y E E R. Uh, so that's what I mean by the language is a bit of a barrier, um, but it's still a very good, good book. 
book and it's one of the classics I think people should read. So that is the Canterbury Tales. Now as I said this is my copy because I've annotated it on it but we do have a copy like this in the library. Now, a non-fiction book which I've been recommending to lots of people is called Get a Financial Life. So this one is just, you know, your basic money guide and that tells you things you should know in your 20s and 30s uh, for your finances uh, and how to get all of those and I find, I think that money books are important for everyone of all ages. So I'll just read you the contents of this. So you have uh, chapter one is crib notes and uh, it's a cheat sheet for time press readers who need to help always handy when they uh, recognise that sometimes you pick up these books because you need to get it fixed and to fix it later. Uh, chapter 2 is taking stock of your financial life, so just kind of how to evaluate where you are with your money. Uh, chapter 3 is dealing with debt, which is handy because you know I know I have student loans uh, and other people have credit card debt and all that stuff um, and debt is something that's not really talked about a lot, so this, it's handy that it talks about it. Uh, chapter 4 is basic banking, you know how to get um, good rates and you know the best way to go about finding a good bank for you. Chapter 5 is all you really need to know about investing, which is kind of scary and honestly like I'm still kind of reading about that chapter <laughs> go back to it. Um, chapter 6 is living the good life in 2070, so it's all about retirement and how to save for retirement. Um, chapter 7 is oh give me a home. So that's on renting and buying a house. Um, chapter eight is insurance, what you need and what you don't. Um, because you know, as you grow older and you move off your, you know, your parents' insurance, you have to find your own. Chapter nine is how to make your life less taxing, which teaches you about taxes and everything. And chapter ten is making the most of military benefits. So what do you do if you serve? Now, I wouldn't apply for that one. No, that doesn't bother me. But it's just overall, this book is full full of really good information. Um, for example, if you want to go to the crib notes, I'll just quickly read. They have a few little, let's see here, there's a few little highlight, a little full thing. I'll go ahead and read those out instead of reading just like a section of it. So number one is ensure yourself against financial ruin. Two is pay off debt the smart way. And number three is start contributing to a tax favourite retirement savings plan. Number four, build an emergency cushion using an automatic savings plan. Number five is considering investing in stock and bond funds. Number six one six <laughs> is find out your credit score and improve it. Number seven, think hard before buying a house or apartment. Number eight is get smart about income tax. Yeah. So those are their eight points. So this book uh, is very handy. This is Larbury's copy so you can take that if you want today. Now I know you said that you really liked fantasy books so I have two for you here. Now obviously I we have the classic Lord of the Rings. So this is the first one in the trilogy. Uh, this is the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, it's your proper high fantasy. Uh, in high fantasy you mean that has nothing to do with our world, nothing based on it. It's a completely different world that never crosses over. Um, versus something like your Harry Potter would just be real. Have you read this one? No, you haven't. I love this trilogy. Obviously there's The Hobbit that comes before it. You don't need to read that to enjoy the story. Um, and if I'm being completely honest and frank, I didn't really enjoy The Hobbit that much. I kind of read it because I knew I wanted to read these. Um, but you don't need to. Uh, and The Lord of the Rings is fantastic. I mean, they are big books. So this one here is 
531 pages, but they read so quick. Like, the fins are fantastic, I say that, but the books are even better. I'm going to put it down. And they also, like, if you can see here in the back of this book, have a map of Middle Earth. So, you can see everything is. Now, this, of course, I was going to map in about 300 pages. I love when books have maps. I don't know, maybe. It's fantastic. So, yeah, this is one of those proper stories. It just, it sucks you in. Oh, so how it's written. It's not written like The Wife of Bath. It's very easy to read. So we do the first little bit over here. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk about it and excitement in Hobbiton. Bilbo was very rich and very particular, and he had the wonder of the Shire for 60 years, ever since his remarkable disappearance and unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed, whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Bagand was full of tunnels of stuffed with treasure. Now that was enough, not enough for fame, there was also his prolonged vigour uh, to marvel at. As time wore on, but it seemed to have a little effect on Mr Baggins. At 90, he was much the same as that of 50. At 99, they began to call him well-preserved, but unchanged would have been nearer the mark. There were some that shook their heads and thought this too much of a good thing. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess, apparently. Perpetual youth as well as perpetual inexhaustible wealth. It will have to be paid for, they said. It isn't natural and trouble will come of it. Um, so if you can get from there, hobbits live a lot longer than us. I think it's at... Hmm, what do I want to remember? Oh, I want to say 50 is around like 20 something, maybe. Hmm, I don't remember. Anyway, you, this is, needs to be on your to be read list, just saying. Right. And the last one I have here is A Court of Thorn and Roses. Now, I know that this author, Sarah J. Moss, has come under scrutiny recently because there is a bit of a lack of diversity in her books and I do agree that she needs to fix that but it's still a really good story. Uh, the basics of it is that is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Um, so there's that. Um, I don't know how, how to describe it. Um, it's regular fantasy because it does cross over a little bit into our world. Um, and it has to do with fae, so you know, like fairies kind of. Um, so I'll read you the back at least, so I'm reading you the first chapter. Feyre is a huntress, and that's the main character. She thinks nothing of slaughtering a wolf to capture its prey, but, like all mortals, she fears what lingers mercilessly beyond the forest, and she will learn that taking the life of a magical creature comes at a high price. Imprisoned in an enchanted court in, uh, in her enemy's kingdom, Feyre is free to roam but forbidden to escape. Her captor's body bears the scars of fighting. His face is always masked, but his piercing stare draws her in ever closer. As Feyre's feelings for Tamlin began to burn through every warning, she's been told about his kind in ancient wicked shadow crows. Feyre so. must find a way to break the spell or lose her heart forever. It's a splendid book. I read it so quickly. Highly recommend. Anyway, I'm so sorry. I think I've kept you long enough rambling on about books. Just nobody wants to listen anymore. So I'll leave you to it. Enjoy the library. I'll be sitting up here at the desk if you need any help.